Before we go any further, we should talk about how to test the conditions or check the conditions for t-tests. Um, this applies to t-tests. It also applies to z-tests. Not that we're going to do them. I'm just going to keep talking about t-tests because that's all we're really going to do, except for proportions. And we do z in a slightly different context. But it's t-tests all the way, all the way down here. So there are conditions. Let me explain why there are conditions. Because we use the normal approximation, and as we've discovered on our previous homework, any time we use the normal approximation, when we assume that uh, some data are close enough to normal, that we can use the normal distribution or t-distribution, same difference, to figure out areas like p-values, which is our big thing, then we're doing normal approximation, which might or might not give accurate results, as you saw on one of the homework assignments, which was to show that sometimes um, some distributions are more normal than others, and therefore the normal approximation will be a better estimate for some distributions and a worse estimate for other distributions. And we're very concerned about getting accurate results. But we keep using this normal approximation because nobody can actually observe the sampling distribution of this or that. So we have to assume that it's normal and use theoretical math to figure out you know, how normal is it probably going to be. So we can use the normal approximation. If it was just data in front of us, we could check. But we can't. We can't get all possible sample means or all possible differences between sample means. That just does not work. So before we do any kind of a test that uses the normal approximation, i.e. that uses the normal curve table or the t-table or, or any, key, any t-table to look up values uh, for p-values or for, or for comparing to alpha or anything like that, then we have to check the conditions. And the reason we do this well, there's two reasons we do conditions, but let's talk about the normal approximation condition first. The biggest reason we do this is to make sure, um, or as much as possible, that we know whether the normal approximation is appropriate, whether it will give us accurate values. Now, nothing's perfectly normal, so our question is really, are the values accurate enough for this analysis, for our purposes in a particular analysis? And so here's our setup. Um, we've got a sample here for sample one and a sample mean, this blue line, and then sample 2 and a sample mean is the red line. The difference between them is the mean, blue, mean 1, and minus the red, mean 2. And we could flip it around and say mean 2 minus mean 1. <coughs> that doesn't matter. So we've got the difference between means. And then we're imagining, to test this difference and see how big it is, then we imagine the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis says that the true difference between means is 0 in the population. So the sampling distribution of means as well as the raw scores has, the, has a mean that is the same. It doesn't matter where that mean is, it just matters that it's the same. And that creates a sampling distribution of differences between all possible means with a mean of zero. That you know, the, the expected difference, if the null hypothesis is true, will be zero. So is that sampling distribution normal or normal enough for our purposes? Now, don't get thrown off by t versus normal. Just tell yourself that t and normal are the same thing. t is what we have to use to estimate the normal uh, when we don't know sigma. So t and, t and normal, same deal. So the normal sampling distribution is the sampling distribution of means or differences between means. And we have to remember what it is that makes a sampling distribution normal or closer to normal or not so close to normal. What is it that affects the normality? of a sampling distribution. The first is whether the original distribution was normal or not. That original distribution, distribution of raw scores, that's the raw materials that were used to create the sampling distribution. If those are normally distributed, then the sampling distribution will be either just as normally distributed or more likely much more normally distributed than that was. So if that's pretty close, then you've got no worries, you're fine. Even with a small sample size, you'd be pretty, pretty good, despite what the textbook says. If you have a large sample size, then even screwed up distributions, so even if the raw score distribution is skewed, then if you have a large enough sample size, then the central limit theorem tells us that the sampling distribution of means, and therefore the sampling distribution of differences between means, both of those respond to the central limit theorem's uh, effects there. The central limit theorem tells us that the sampling distribution will be normal, and it will be much, much more normal as the sample size increases. So if you get above that kind of magical value, it's not magical, it's just textbook makes a point of 30, that's fine. If you get above about a 30 sampling, uh, sample size, then you can tolerate some, some moderate violations of normality in your population. And if you get up to like 50, 100, 200, 500, then you can tolerate some pretty serious violations of normality in your sampling distribution. So the first set of conditions 
that we need to check for doing a t-test is whether the sampling distribution is normal. And so first of all, we look to and see how much skew there is in the sample. Just do a histogram, because our sample is our best estimate of what's happening in the population. So we check the sample distribution to tell us about the population distribution. And it doesn't have to be normal, just sort of symmetrical. <coughs> because the central limit theorem takes care of uh, non-symmetrical normality pretty quickly, or symmetrical, norm symmetrical non-normality pretty quickly. Um, skew is a little bit worse than fat tails or thin tails. So if there is any skew, then just have a bigger sample, sample size. Exactly how big people disagree on this, the open intro text authors make a pretty reasonable recommendation, I think. You know, they're smarter than I am. They suggest sample size um, 30 or above if you have a little bit of skew, like moderate type skew, like if your skew is above or outside the bounds, I imagine, of maybe one or negative one, if you're gonna check that with R or SPSS. And if it's going up to like two, or beyond, or three, then make sure you have a lot more than 30. So you should be going up to like 50 or 100 or 200 or something like that. And if you can't find that, then you should not be using the normal approximation. You shouldn't be doing a t-test, you shouldn't be doing anything like that, because you're gonna be wrong. And seriously wrong, your p-values are gonna be wrong, your hypothesis results are gonna be wrong, your confidence intervals are gonna be wrong. Now the next set of conditions isn't about the distribution at all, it's about independence. The observations <clears throat> must be sampled from the population independently. It doesn't mean they can't be correlated with each other just because they happen to be correlated with each other. That's not really the issue here. The issue is they have to be selected in a manner that is independent from the population. Now, there's something particular about this population that everything is all related to each other in ways that are bad for your sampling. That's fine, but we're not going to deal with that too much in this class. We're just going to deal with this much more important issue most of the time. Are they selected independently from each other? So how do we check this? Pretty much two ways. It's hard to select, it's, it's hard to test directly. There are funky stats tests for independence. We're not going to worry about those. So the first thing is just check and see whether there's any non-independence in the sampling process. For this class, just consider that that means that you need to uh, learn as much as you can about the sampling process and discover whether there is any reason to suspect non-independence in the way that cases were taken from the population and put into the sample. So any non-independence in the sampling. A classic example of non-independent sampling is called snowball sampling, where you recruit a group of participants and then you have those people recruit more participants and then those people recruit more participants. There's serious dependence in sampling because uh, depending on who gets recruited first, then that changes the probability of who gets recruited in the second and third wave because they recruit their friends and their relatives and things. So you're going to end up having a population with characteristics that are more similar to each other than, than in the actual population. I mean, a sample with characteristics more similar to each other than the population, etc. So if there's nothing like that going on, and most of the time there won't be, just learn what you can about the sampling procedures. If you can't learn anything about the sampling procedures, but there's something that suggests this was a... Uh, an anonymous survey or something like that, then just go ahead and assume that there's probably not a problem, but look, and I don't know, maybe I'll throw in some surprises every once in a while to make sure you're checking, but, <coughs> but check the sampling and make sure that there's no evidence of, of funky dependent sampling stuff going on. Any sampling where selecting one uh, individual from the population really changes the probabilities of selecting the other people. Now, Usually there's no problem. Now the next one, the next piece to check for independence is to check whether the sampling was effectively with replacement. Now it never actually truly is with replacement because if we did, then we might have the same person twice in one sample, and that's crazy. We can't do that, our stats don't, or don't allow for that. But the reason we care about sampling with replacement is that if it's without replacement, then the probabilities of each person being selected are dependent on which people were selected before, right? Or not people, cases were selected from the population before. But if it's a big enough population, and if you have a small, a small portion of it as your sample, then those probabilities aren't very big. It, the probabilities don't shift very much, so we can just pretend like it's with replacement. So the textbook suggests that if you have a nice small pr proportion of the population, if your sample isn't a big piece of the population itself, then those effects can be ignored. And yeah, they're incredibly small. And for most sampling, it's incredibly small. So, number one, we need to check. This is just recap. If you skipped everything else, make sure you know this. We just check two things, independence and normality of the sampling distribution. So, 
Are the observations selected independently? Number one, make sure there's no reason to suspect there's non-independent sampling in the sampling procedures. And number two, this is a textbook recommend it, recommendation, and it makes perfect sense. Make sure the sample size is less than 10% of the size of the full population. So if you have a population that only has 100 people in it and you have a sample of 20, then you're in trouble because your sample is 20% of the population. And yeah, you can imagine that that can mess up your stats to, cer to a certain extent. You don't have independence anymore. So that's checking independence. And number two, check whether the sampling distribution is normal. Either A, there's little or no skew in the sampling distribution and n is greater than 30. So this is the textbook. They're kind of saying never ever do a t-test with an n less than 30. I don't necessarily agree. I think in some situations it's okay. I, I mean, reading other authors, this isn't me being all smart, reading other statisticians, a lot of people recommend uh, that it's okay to do t-tests with a sample size less than 30, but the normality of your sample becomes more important. It should be pretty normal. And your sampling procedures, your sample should be randomly selected from the population, becomes even more important than it usually is. And it's usually pretty important. So little or no skew. And then if there is skew, make sure your sample size is big. A higher sample size if there's more skew. So this is, it's just these two things, independence and normality of the sampling distribution. Independence, just no reason to suspect the procedures are messed up and non-independent, and that your sample size is less than 10% of the full population. So if you've got a sample of a couple hundred people and then the population is like all children in the United States or something, well, yeah, that's millions of children. Of course, you've got less than 10%. Most of the time, that's not an issue. And then sampling distribution, either little or no skew in the sample, or if there is skew, then make sure that your sample size is really big. So when do we check these? Before we do our tests. Sometimes we forget and do them afterwards, and then you sometimes have to throw out the results of your tests and not report them. We also do them before we calculate any confidence intervals. Anytime before we use the normal approximation, we need to check these conditions, because these are conditions for using the normal approximation. And that's all.